So welcome everyone to today's CCNB seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rosen Rademacher, uh, who is uh, joining us online today. And uh, Rosen is an expert in working memory. Uh, so we are also hearing a working memory talk today. Very excited about this, somewhere between working memory and the translation into actions. Uh, Rosen was originally trained as psychologist, was then doing a um, PhD in uh, neuroscience, uh, was for this uh, in uh, Nijmegen and uh, then the PhD in Maastricht and was then working for multiple years uh, with John Serances um, in the beautiful sunny uh, San Diego, California. Uh, to then from there uh, move to Germany and now being in uh, Frankfurt uh, at the Ernst uh, Strüngmann Institute from where she is today uh, joining us online and we are very excited uh, to hear your talk today. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you also so much for having me and for inviting me. Um, I usually like to invite people to ask questions as I go along. Of course, um, if you're not comfortable because there's a recording or so, then feel free to ask your question at the end. But if there is a question as I go, then uh, especially if it's a clarification question, also but conceptual questions the same, please feel free to ask them. Then finally, I want to add some credit. So thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I also worked with Frank Tong for a couple of years and um, those were very formative for me as well. So I think he definitely deserves uh, a lot of credit for training me. All right, so today I will talk about flexible formats and loci of visual working memory, but I'll start with a quick introduction, of course, uh, and you are all in Berlin, presumably. So I, I tailored this uh, to a Berlin situation where I'm going to ask you to hold this image in mind and I'll take this image away. Now I will show you another image and please clap if this is the same image and clap twice if you think it's a different image. Yeah, all right, here comes another image. I hear some very silent clapping in the background. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe the, the sound from here to there is okay, but um, I assume that everyone was clapping because generally this task is pretty easy and people are able to do it, at which point I also say, you did it, that's great, you're amazing, um, and you probably did this using your visual working memory, so you may have had some visual representation of this Brandenburg tour during this gap, and that allowed you to then, during this test, say that that was the same image. Now I will borrow here a definition from cognitive psychology about what working memory is and how we can define working memory. So this is the ability to maintain and manipulate information in mind over a time span of several seconds. And it's really considered this core component of many cognitive functions, including language, problem solving, reasoning, um, but also abstract thought. And I'll get back to this uh, throughout the talk. So, in everyday life, you may not be in a room where I just show you a Brandenburger tour, but you may be on the bike looking for the Brandenburger tour while you're holding it in mind. You're seeing all these other pedestrians and you want to make sure you don't crash into them. So you have to pro process this visual input, remember the Brandenburger tour, match it with something in your environment uh, and pay attention to your surroundings. Now, in the lab, we use studies that are more similar to that first example. So a brief image of something that then goes away and that you have to remember. So very early work in monkeys would have a monkey fixate in the center of the screen, then a dot would be shown somewhere in the periphery. And over some delay period, the monkey would have to remember that location. And then after the delay, it would have to make an eye movement towards that position. And so using these kinds of paradigms, people have found that there is sustained firing of neurons in the prefrontal cortex that code for this position in space. Um, now, throughout the years, there are also signals uh, that are related to working memory found in both temporal and parietal cortex, and this has been largely confirmed uh, with fMRI work, uh, once fMRI got onto the scene as well. Now, somewhat more recently, people have shown that from patterns of activity in primary visual cortex, you can decode the contents of what someone is holding in memory when you're using visual working memory. And so throughout this talk, I'll be using visual working memory as a proxy for working memory, but that's because uh, the, the visual cortex is, is very well understood uh, 
And it's a really nice model system, if you will, as a, for sensory uh, perception, and in this case also for how sensory areas are involved in working memory. Okay, so this involvement of uh, primary visual cortex has really revived this theory or kind of gave, gave credence to this theory of sensory recruitment. So I'm again, very cartoonish, right? But I will give you a sense of what sensory recruitment theory is. So you may have some kind of behavioral goal, such as remember a face. And if you want to remember that face with really high visual precision, you may want to recruit the part of cortex that is able to have these detailed visual representations, which is visual cortex. Uh, and here I'm showing a picture of my postdoc supervisor back when I was still in San Diego, John Sirensis. Um, I encourage everyone to make fun of their supervisors in their talks, including people in my lab, um, because it's always fun. All right, so, but this is the general outline of sensory recruitment theory, but you may not need a very highly detailed visual image of someone. You can also abstract that. Uh, you can say, John, uh, just the name, you don't need the image with it. Uh, or even if you have to remember the face, you can abstract it further. You don't need all this fine detail. You could imagine something that's like an oval with two dots and, and, a, and a line that represent eyes and mouth or so. So again, this very cartoonish, cartoonish image of where visual working memory is in the brain and what are the neural correlates of visual working memory, which has been a question that's dominated the field for a long time showed you a lot of brain areas, right? So the question could be if now the entire brain is maybe involved in visual working memory because even visual cortex is involved. Um, and this is indeed a question that people have asked. Some people have said, well, frontal cortex is obviously this critical memory storage site because it then recruits um, visual cortex. But others have said that, well, maybe visual cortex is a critical memory storage site because as it turns out, um, behavioral performance, so how well people do on a given task, and the degree to which you can decode the information and memory from V1 are actually correlated. So I won't go into these figures in too much detail, but the idea here is that each dot is a different participant, behavioral threshold is on the y-axis, and uh, some form of decoding, some metric of decoding is on the x-axis, and you see that indeed with better behavioral performance, you have higher decoding. Similar in this plot on the right, what you see there is if you chop the data up in three bins of, let's say, goodness of decoding, you see that, um, or sorry, goodness of behavior, that this, this darkest, greenest bin, that's the worst behavioral bin, you see that the decoding is also biased in the same direction as the behavior. All right. So is any one area actually critical for me memory storage? Because you could say prefrontal cortex, you could say parietal cortex, you could say visual cortex. I would argue that this is actually the wrong question to ask. So we should turn this question kind of upside down. Instead of looking for a neural correlate, we should, we should say that, well, working memory is, is this mental workspace of the mind that you're using in service of a particular behavior, in, in service of a particular task. And this must therefore, almost by definition, be distributed because that will ensure the robustness of the memories so that even if you're biking around, uh, and you're distracted by another cyclist, let's say, that you don't immediately forget that you were looking for the one in Boca Tour. So you need to have a robust memory, but it also needs to be flexible. So if then your behavioral goal changes, you want to also change uh, how you are uh, using your working memory. Okay, so today I'll probably have time for three different studies. Let's see how far we get. Um, but I want to start by asking this question about visual working memory and visual perception, both occurring in V1. And why do I think that's an interesting question? Because V1 is this first cortical target of visual input. And so this is where visual input gets processed. But now we have seen that it also holds information about the contents of working memory. And that on the one hand, you can say, well, that's useful because that's where you have this fine grained detail. Um, but on the other hand, you can say, well, but that's not very useful at all, because if that same area is involved, how do you even keep mental contents apart from, you know, stimulus driven uh, information? So what is the format of these memory representations? And it almost necessarily has to differ from sensory like representations, because otherwise, exactly how would you how would you keep them apart? So how and if 
it differs from sensory representations. So the task that we used for this uh, to answer this question is pretty straightforward. So on the one hand, we have a sensory task here on the left. Um, and what happens there is that there is this grading of a random orientation and it's phase reversed every 250 milliseconds for nine seconds in total. And while the stimulus is on the screen, subjects are fixating and they're detecting small changes in contrast in the stimulus. So this is like pure stimulus driven activity. Now in a memory task, different tasks, they only see the stimulus for 500 milliseconds and then it goes away and they have to remember it for 13 seconds. And so there we can look at patterns of activity during the working memory delay. Now, full disclosure, in this task, and this data is actually borrowed from a paper that we had in 2019, there was, uh, during the delay, either nothing on the screen, another grading on the screen, or a noise patch on the screen. Yeah? So, um, but for today, I won't go into that too deeply. So we tested six subjects. We had about 324 trials or more per task, and we collected those data over the course of three scan sessions where we scanned the whole brain. Okay. So just to quickly reiterate the results from 2019, first and foremost, here I'm plotting behavioral error. So how uh, bad were people at uh, recalling this orientation that they had to remember? And actually at the very end, I didn't mention that, but they saw uh, a line, a dial that they got to rotate um, to match the orientation that they held in memory. And so on average, you see people are about six degrees off and there is no difference between these three conditions. So even when there was a distractor on the screen, that didn't impact uh, performance. That's, that's interesting in its own right, and that's that's why this paper um, also, um, but kind of the main claims of this paper, but that's not what I'll be talking about today. Um, the other thing to show here is that the decoding, when we look now at area B1, so primary visual cortex, is there um, throughout the delay, during the delay here, what I'm showing, um, and it's again the same for these three conditions. So behavior is the same, decoding in V1 is the same. Now, if we go further up the visual hierarchy to the parietal sulcus, interparietal sulcus, and here I'm showing IPS zero and IPS one, so there's a few areas there in the parietal sulcus. What you see is that there's still some decoding in IPS zero, but once you get to IPS one, you cannot really recover anymore the orientation that was being remembered. Now, what this gives us is a hint at the representational formats. Why, you may ask. Well, there was a study that inspired our work that wanted to know, can you decode working memory contents during distraction? Um, and they showed that, well, yes, you can in parietal cortex, but you cannot in early visual cortex. And as you saw, that's actually the exact opposite of what I just showed you, because we saw that, yes, we can decode this in early visual cortex, but we cannot by the time we get to area IPS, so the interparietal sulcus. Why is that the case? So what I haven't told you so far is that when we use our decoder, we use this sensory data, this sensory task, we would train our decoder on that, and then we would test our decoder on the data from the working memory delay. So this generalization from the sensory data to this memory data tells us something about the format. And I'll get into that in more detail in a little bit, but this is what the data look like. Now I'm showing you all these areas in the parietal sulcus, so IPS 0 through IPS 3. And indeed, when we train on the sensory data, there's kind of convincingly nothing there, right? There seems to be no in information about the memory item in this part of the brain. But the other thing you can do, and what the other paper also did, they used the memory data itself to train their decoder in some the cross validation. So leave one run out uh, or leave one trial out. So they used that data to train the decoder and the same data to test. Now, when we do that to our data, we see that there actually is a lot of information about the remembered item in area IPS. So why is that the case? Well, the hypothesis that we had at that time is that there may be this high dimensional representation that you have, so sort of a pixel by pixel retinotopic, really visual representation of the working memory, and that might live in early visual cortex. But you don't have to, when you do this kind of memory task, you don't have to remember the exact image of the grading 
you can also condense that to a much lower dimensional format, such as a Cartesian coordinate or a vector representation or something like that. And this lower dimensional representation might be somewhere in, in IPS, so parietal cortex. So we know that when we train on the sensory stimulus and we test during the working memory delay, that that uh, representational format is kind of the same. So that cross generalizes, but that doesn't mean that there is no representation in IPS. It just means that there is no representation that looks like a sensory driven response. So we hypothesize here that, well, maybe there are higher levels, higher levels of abstraction outside of this early sensory cortex where you reduce the dimensionality of the thing that you have to remember. So what we should- Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, why should it be lower dimensional? I don't get that. I get why it's non-sensory like, yeah. but I don't get why yeah, it should yeah. be lower dimensional. So that's the hypothesis part of it. Right. So we in the paper in, in 2019, we were also very vague about it. We said, well, it's not sensory driven. So it's another kind of representation. But what we were thinking is that, well, this visual representation is really high dimensional, right? Even if it's not pixel by pixel, but you have this spatial representation uh, in retinotopic cortex, you could really condense that to do this kind of task. So that's a kind of a yeah, that's the hypothesis there. Yeah, yeah I see. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. OK. So again, being agnostic so far to what this representation is, we can say that at least there are multiple levels of representation and they seem to exist concurrently. So we see different representations when we look at V1 versus when we look at uh, parietal cortex. Uh, and another, I think, really important point that we make separately in the separate paper is that how you train your model really matters, right? So, so model training, different model training approaches, they, they're really, are sometimes suited to answer very specific questions, but not other questions. Okay, that's just as an aside. So, okay, and, and this goes back to your question a little bit more specifically, what is then the format of these memory representations? So we can look at that by using representational similarity analysis. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with this, I will do a really quick introduction. Um, so this is my friend Sirawaj. He was also in the Serensis lab when I was there. Let's say I show you his face while you're in the scanner. And then on the next trial, I show you his face again. I can measure patterns of responses from your brain and just simply correlate them. Yeah, so the first time I show you, the second time I show you. And what you get then is, let's say, a high similarity in this case, because I show you the same face twice and those patterns of activity are very similar. So they're very correlated. Um, now I can show you his face again, but now he's wearing an EEG cap. And so the pattern of activity may still be quite similar. But on other trials, I can show you gazebos. I'm not sure why gazebos. People do this in the literature, so we had to do it too, but don't ask me why exactly. But if I show you gazebos now, what you would see is that, well, the pattern of activity evoked by gazebos is very dissimilar to the patterns of activity evoked by faces. So you can fill this out entirely. So you may see that all faces are kind of similar to each other all gazebos are dissimilar to the faces. But if we fill this out more, we see that gazebos are similar to uh, themselves, but again, dissimilar to faces. Yeah, so this is fake data. It's just an example of how uh, this analysis works. And then what you can do is make some models. Um, in one case, you could say, well, things are only similar to themselves and to nothing else. Um, this is, of course, not the model that, that's being shown here or that fits the data. But the second model, which would be something like, well, things within one category are similar to themselves. Okay, so, but this one, we got to the end? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you can make some data, you can make some models. All right, um, so we didn't have faces and gazebos, as, as I told you at the very beginning, we had orientations. Um, by the way, the phone thing works, so next time it cuts out, just call me and then I'll try to rejoin. <laughs> Yeah, so we had orientations. So this was work together with Chaipa Chunharas, who was also in Serensis Lab, and he's in Thailand now uh, as a PI. So, but we did for each region of interest, we had, of course, a number of trials and some number of voxels, and we would do a split half of those data. And then the next step was that we would bin the orientation. So let's say every trial where there was an orientation of three degrees, we would take all those trials and average them in one half of the data and average them in the other half of the data with some smoothing here, so plus minus 10 degrees. Um, and then we would correlate that 
one bin, that one split half, um, the response is to three degrees with the other half and also with every other orientation in the other half. So what you get then is a representational similarity matrix that looks something like this. So from one to 180 um, with high similarity for orientations that are similar and a little bit lower for orientations that are dissimilar. So we didn't just do this once. Of course, we split the data a thousand times and we did that for each subject and also for each region of interest. Okay, everyone's still there? Let me check. Yes. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm getting paranoid. <laughs> okay. So um, just to remind you of what this might look like, this would look something like what you see on the left, just because physical orientation is continuous. So what do I mean by that? Is that if I show you an orientation of 42 degrees and I show you that orientation again, you may get a really high similarity score. But also for orientations that are really nearby and very similar, you may expect a pattern that's also still quite similar. And only as you go further and further away in orientation space would these patterns become more dissimilar. Yeah? So this is kind of what you would expect just based on the physics of how orientation, of the, the physical space that is orientation space. OK. So now to the most exciting part, which is the data. So remember, we had the sensory task where we showed this grading, just visually driven responses. Uh, and I'll plot this for primary visual cortex here over on the left and some other early visual areas, then IPS and one object area. So when we do this analysis for the sensory task, what we see is that especially in these early visual areas, you see the strong diagonal component, right, give or take. Um, it, it peters out a little bit here in IPS, so, so we already know that we cannot decode very well from there, so that shouldn't be too surprising that we don't see strong patterns also in the RSA. Uh, and also in LO, we see kind of this, this strong diagonal. Um, what's the coolest here, though, is when we compare this now to um, the geometry that we see during the working memory delay, and that is that even at a first glance, you can see that these patterns are completely different especially when we go to area, let's say, V3AB or uh, IPS0, you see that instead of a strong diagonal, what you, you get is kind of more these two kind of squares. And these are centered on oblique orientations, so 45 and 135 degrees, so these tilted orientations. So, and, and this is the cool thing, like a little background behind this project. This analysis we did in a day, right, in the pandemic, and we're like, whoa, this is... is spectacular, it's completely different. Um, how are we going to quantify this? And how do we do that in a principled way? And then the rest of the time was basically spent trying to model these data and then trying to convince reviewers that our models are not crazy um, and that we have made, in the meanwhile, many models um, to kind of quantify this thing that you can see by eye quite clearly. But OK, so how did we do this as a first pass? So we used visual input statistics. And uh, now I bring back the Frankfurt skyline. And one thing that you can see here, you may notice straight away, is that there's lots of vertical and lots of horizontal orientations. Um, but you say, OK, maybe you're cheating because, you know, Frankfurt has a skyline and other places it wouldn't be that way. But actually, it turns out that also in natural scenes, such as this forest scene, if you look at parts of the image that have strong orientation content, which are highlighted here in red, and you just count the different orientations and their, their probability, you will see that orientations that are vertical and horizontal are more probable than the other orientations. So they're just more of them. So we thought, OK, we will use this as uh, our visual input statistics uh, as a basis for our model. So we took a function that looks like this. Um, and then we said, we will make one model that we want to reflect basically what would the visual system do. So we call this our veridical model. So what did we do? We took 180 orientation filters. So these are just 180 Balmaisis functions. And then we changed the amplitude of each function based on the height of this probability distribution. So for horizontal and vertical, you get higher amplitude uh, responses from this uh, efficient neural representation. Um, we used amplitude modulation, which also is something you can, you can ask questions about. Um, we did this because we know in fMRI that these orientations, vertical and horizontal, they give rise to higher bold responses. Previous work has shown that. All right, 
So now what we can do, we can present, if you will, any kind of orientation to this bank of filters. We can read out the response. So you get 180 numbers and you can correlate that with every other orientation that you show to this bank of filters. And from that, you can create this veridical uh, RSM. So this representational similarity uh, matrix. Now, this is strong diagonal. It's a little bit thicker here at um, the cardinals again. I will get into this uh, with, with more other models, but this is initially what we did. Um, and that is supposed to represent the, the, the way the visual system may interpret this, this visual information. Okay, then to try to explain what might be happening during working memory, and now we go towards this abstraction. We thought, okay, if you need to condense something such as an orientation, what may you do? You may also use this input function here, but to classify or to categorize, if you will, different orientation, you may use something which we've dubbed the psychological distance. So what do I mean by that? So if I show you two orientations that are close to a cardinal, but are both on two different sides of that cardinal, those two orientations, they may look very different from one another. And there are demos that also you can use that can show this. If you see two orientations that are both on one side of a cardinal, they will look also very, you, you'll be able to discriminate them really easily. Whereas if you have a similar difference in orientations, but they're somewhere in part of the orientation space where you have a lower resolution, those two will not look very different. So we take the, the, the length basically that you have to travel across this curve as a measure of the psychological distance. And then of course we can do that again for every orientation relative to every other orientation. And what we get then is this categorical model. So you already see that there's these two um, squares that are centered on the oblique orientations. So next we fit these models to our two tasks. So first, when we fit this to our sensory task, we see that in gray here, the veridical model basically outperforms the categorical model throughout the visual hierarchy, maybe not in IBS. And that while the categorical model explains some amount of variance, uh, it's, it's definitely the vertical model here that wins. If we look at the data from the memory task, what we see is that there's this gradual increase in the amount of variance explained by the categorical model, uh, and especially V3, uh, V4, and IPS0, you see that that model is just doing a way better job at explaining our data. Can I ask a question, please? Yep. That's Cool. Um, so I forgot the task they were doing, because if they're doing just a left-right task, then the right model looks exactly like a, the behavior, I guess. Mm -hmm. But if they were doing a continuous orientation task, then yeah. it's different. Yeah, they so were doing a, a method of adjustment task. OK. Yeah. So they had to replicate the orientation that they remembered as precisely as possible. That was their instruction. Yeah. 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 So they're not, yeah. So you see some sort of left-right representation thing, <laughs> it's, even though they're not doing a left-right task. Yeah. Yeah. So it appears that in terms of the representation that we see is that basically any orientation that's kind of between two cardinals, they're all represented very similarly. And that any orientation that's on the other side, between the other side of cardinals, if you will, um, that that is also all similar to each other, but those two are very dissimilar to one another. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting because it doesn't explain how that they can do the task. No, 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 it yeah. doesn't. And that's yeah. so interestingly enough, right? So in V1, I can go back to the data. So we looked at this for, for forever. Oh, yeah, I don't have my uh, <laughs> presenter view. In V1, mm -hmm. it's still somewhat more diagonally. Mm -hmm. But you see this really strong categorization, especially in, in an area like IPS. And you might wonder, like, how can you even decode here? But that's because you still have more diagonal than you have off diagonal in the end, right? But it's, uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's Makes fascinating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, thanks. <laughs> OK, so bonus model, um, because we, we, yeah, there's lots of things to say, right? You can model this in infinite ways. And that's partly the beauty, partly the problem. But one thing that we try to do here is make it even more simple and go with a single parameter model. So what we did, we again take this input statistics function, but now we change the shape of it by using different exponents. So this is, uh, I think, uh, 
a race cosine or something. I, I don't remember exactly what function went into it, but if you change the exponent on it, you can make it steeper. Or um, if you make the exponent small enough, you can even make it kind of go uh, convex. So we simulated here just a few of these different exponents to give you a flavor of what the model will look like. So when you make basically the zigzag shape, you see basically a pure diagonal. If you increase the exponent, you start seeing these two um, squares to the very extreme over here on the right. And you can also go the other way. And this looks a little bit like our veridical model, um, but you can again go to the extremes. And this, you get the opposite prediction basically from what you would get on the other side of the spectrum. So what we can now do, we can feed it the data from one given region of interest. And we say, okay, find the best fitting exponent that can explain the pattern of data here. And when we do that, we see that in the sensory test, the best fitting exponent is basically always this zigzag, so this diagonal. Um, but when we look in the memory task, we find the same thing where there's this increasing degree or the increasing extent of categoricalness as you go from very early visual areas uh, all the way up to IPS zero. Okay, and then I think this is the last slide on this part, um, which is, I think, just something that I thought was really cool. I had never done this before, um, which is the second order representation similarity. So now you can take all these different individual regions of interest, and here I'm chopping them up quite finely. So I take the ventral and the dorsal parts, and I split up all the IPS areas and so forth. Um, and you can correlate those with each other. And when you do that for the sensory task, you get data that looks something like this. Um, you can also represent it uh, in a different way. What you see, first of all, is that there's a big cluster here of high similarity between all the early visual areas. And kind of a second cluster here were all the uh, parietal cortex areas and then another kind of objecty cluster over here. And what I just think is so cool about this is that when you look at this diagram, you're basically recovering what we know about the anatomical structure of visual cortex, but this is pure functional data. So this is just not even a complex stimulus. You're just showing a grading and you're driving visual cortex. And based on the patterns of activity that you evoke there, you can basically recover this anatomical structure. Now, of course, we also do this for the working memory delay. Um, we see a few things. First of all, this becomes a little bit flatter. So things become more similar uh, overall. And that's what you might expect, right? This, this is purely feedback driven. So if there's this feedback signal coming from somewhere up high, then that will probably dictate more or less how things are represented throughout. Um, and we see particularly here that IPS, which used to be part of the IPSs during perception, uh, now really gets clustered in with the early visual areas. All right. So um, I've shown that perceived orientations are largely represented veridically. And that these remembered orientations, they become gradually more and more categorical as you go up along the visual hierarchy up to area IPS zero. And I also hope that you're convinced that these input statistics may have a high potential to model perception and memory of potentially many more features, right? So you could do this for spatial frequency or for any other feature of which you know the input statistics or kind of the, the distribution of input statistics. Okay, so here the central question is if working memory can be flexibly reformatted based on behavioral demands. So at the very beginning, I talked about flexible formatting uh, and this is an example of that. So now we're back in Berlin uh, looking for the Brandenburger tour once again. Um, and we want to know how the brain supports, in this case, visual spatial working memory. So to, to find or to remember a position in space. Um, and I just want to highlight Maggie Henderson, who did amazing work on this project. So this is something I started again a long time ago, um, but then I got pregnant with my second daughter and Maggie masterfully finished this project. So she did a really amazing job. So, okay, how may you want to find the Brandenburger tour. One thing you could do is bring to mind a bunch of visual information of landmarks that you would see along the way. So Checkpoint Charlie, et cetera. Alternatively, you can say, okay, well, I'm coming out of the subway stop at the, the U-Bahn over here. And to go to the Brandenburger tour, I just need to remember a series of motor commands. So I go straight, left, right, and then straight again. So 
can the format of memory representations actually change when we change the behavioral requirements? So could we maybe push people from visual strategies to motor strategies, and as in this example? And uh, the task we used for this was not to find a Brandenburg tour, unfortunately, it was much more boring. We asked people to remember a target location um, that is shown here by this white dot, but could appear anywhere on this circle. The circle was invisible to subjects, by the way, um, over, over a delay of um, 15 seconds, I think, in total. But first, we... Uh, uh, made them attentive of um, the onset of a target. The target appeared, the target disappeared for one second. And then we had two manipulations. We manipulated whether they needed to use retrospective or prospective memory. What do I mean by that? So after the short interval, the central fixation cue would change to another color. And this color indicated that when they saw this preview disk over here, this disk would be identical to the disk that they saw during the response. Now, what was exactly the task of the subjects? Subjects had to indicate on which side of this disk the target was positioned. So in this case, the target would be roughly here. Again, this is not visible to the subject, but they saw the target, they see this disk, they know that the target was somewhere on this light side. And in this case, the light side corresponds to a right button press. So they see this preview disk, they know it's 100% predictive, of the response disk, so they can say, I will have to press with my right finger. And then 12 seconds later, as soon as they see the response disk, they again can press with this right finger. So this is, let's say, the perspective case where they know during the delay what they will do at the very end. So this cue is informative. Of course, we have on the other half of trials an uninformative uh, preview disk. So again, the fixation dot changes color, but in this case, blue means that this preview disk is completely uninformative of what will happen during the response. So even though they know that this dot fell on this light side, it doesn't help them because at the response, this disk can be randomly oriented any other way. So here at the end, if they remember the target position, they'll be able to say, well, it would fall on the dark side of the disk. And in this case, they would actually use their other finger. Okay, so yes, so this informative situation is, is kind of your prospective motor memory, if you will. And in this un uninformative situation, we have to use this retrospective, uh, more spatial working memory to do the task. So we scan six subjects. Uh, importantly, these target locations and disk orientations were random and also counterbalanced so that were, one was not predictive of the other. And we collected 200 trials per condition. So first of all, importantly, I mean, we told subjects to use these, these disks to their advantage if they could, and they were able to do so. So in the informative case, their accuracy was slightly higher and their response times were faster. So, so far, so good. Now we also looked first at the univariate responses, of course, uh, and when we look in V1, one thing that sort of forgotten now in the literature, but if you look at just bold responses, there is no elevated bold response uh, in early sensory cortex during the working memory delay. So it's really all patterns of responses that we, we look at. It looks like maybe there's some difference here. It's not significant. If we look in area IPS, we now see that there is higher bold when these motor responses cannot be pre-planned. So when the spatial position has to be uh, remembered in the uninformative condition, and this replicates uh, previous work that was done yeah, in area IPS in this kind of task. And then finally, uh, in M1, so now we're looking at a motor area, we see that activity here is actually elevated with the informative preview disk. So there's a little bump here it's in the informative case. So there's some decoding in area M1, which during the rest of the delay, by the way, it goes uh, back to baseline. And again, this also um, replicates previous work. So this is not very controversial. The next thing we did, however, was decoding spatial position. And I'll give a little bit of detail here because we used something um, that we did for the first time in 2019, but that is, I think, a really nice way to avoid problems with, with continuous spaces where often people will just bin orientations. But the problem you have then is that at the edges of bins, two orientations may be really similar. So you, you cannot, as a person, even tell them apart. So your decoder also cannot tell them apart. So what did we do here? We basically took 
positions, spatial positions that were here uh, at zero degrees, here at 180 degrees. We binned those, and then we trained a two-way decoder to tell positions here from positions here. And then we rotate this wedge basically around the circle, so four times. So we use four two-way decoders, and we just take the average over those. Yeah, that's our decoding accuracy measure. OK, so when we look at decoding accuracy now, so again, a whole bunch of brain areas. And here at the very end, we also have S1, M1, and premotor cortex. When we look at decoding accuracy here, we see that in the informative condition, so where people are able to kind of predict which button they have to press, so they could use purely perspective memory, we still see that we can decode spatial position um, in early visual areas. So it's not like people are offloading the information entirely, but it's also true that in the uninformative condition where they have no idea which button they're going to have to press, decoding of spatial position is much, much higher. So there's strong differences here between uh, the informative and uninformative conditions. Um, so yeah, particularly in early, early visual areas, um, but also in area IPS, we see that, especially in the uninformative case, we can decode, but in the informative case, actually now we cannot decode. And in motor cortex uh, and premotor cortex, there's not much going on. Okay, now the other cool thing we can do here is we can decode the actual button uh, that people will press. So. Now we don't need to do any kind of fancy tricks. We just do a two-way decoder, a single two-way decoder to decode which button they're going to press, the left or the right one. Now, when we plot decoding accuracy for all these areas, and again, I didn't mention this on the, on the previous slide, but we're using um, the delay period data and we're using a leap one run out cross validation here. Um, when we try to decode which button people are going to press during the delay, so this is information about this prospective button press, we see that in this informative condition, so where they know the final position of this disk and they know which button they may want to press, that we can decode this prospective button press from S1, M1, and premotor cortex. Um, and of course, we cannot do this in the informative case, which is you know, a good sanity check. They don't know which button they're going to have to press and we cannot decode what they are going to press either. So yeah, especially these areas uh, close to motor cortex are, are what's uh, relevant here. So you may also ask yourself, is there some kind of information handoff? And here I have to, of course, be very careful because we're talking about fMRI and the temporal resolution isn't great, even though we scanned uh, with a high multiband sequence, so that means that we have uh, TRs every 800 milliseconds. So it's relatively fast, but it's not the kind of uh, temporal resolution you may want for this kind of question, but okay, we can still try to look at it. Um, and when we do that, and we look at area V1, we see that in the informative case, there is initially, of course, you know, you get a bunch of decoding because you saw this dot and you see your Q. So this is actually that first disk here, this, this gray bar. This is the second gray disk, the second gray bar. And you see that some point after the preview disk was shown, if you know which button you're going to press, then actually spatial decoding really drops close to chance here. And if we look at decoding in M1, what we see is that around the same time as spatial decoding drops kind of to the floor, we see that decoding of the perspective button press in M1 rises and then stays stable throughout the delay. Um, and here we see a, a correlate here of this increased reaction time also um, when they see the second uh, disk. Okay, so the conclusion here is that there are several loci and several codes, but in this case, if you don't know which button you have to press, you may need to remember a really high spatial resolution. So a uh, kind of representation in, in visual areas. But if you do know which button you have to press, you don't need to recruit these visual areas anymore. You can basically offload this representation into a perspective button press code. So this is a different part of the brain and different formats in this case. So the point here is that these dedicated cortical regions can use specialized codes depending on the task at hand. So these codes can be flexibly reformatted. I just said that. Um, retrospective spatial working memory information can be decoded from visual cortex, 
But if you know which button you're going to have to press, you have this prospective button press memory information that can be decoded in motor cortex. I have told you about a central workspace of the mind, and I think that's the right way to think about uh, visual working memory, which then supports behavioral goals both flexibly, so to change uh, your representations if your task changes, but also keep information in mind in a robust manner. So as I showed you at the very beginning, um, working memory representation were very robust against visual distractors, for example. Now, visual working memories, or visual working memory representations can be abstracted in various ways, and they can also be distributed across several loci in the brain to flexibly guide behavior. Um, and I believe that this distribution really helps ensure both the robustness uh, of the working memory maintenance, um, as well as recall. I didn't talk about recall today, but it also helps you uh, when you have to uh, recall the working memory item at the very end of the trial. Okay, then with that, I want to thank the people who did a lot of the work also on some of the slides you didn't see. So this is Juliana Giorgiani, one of my grad students. Uh, and these people you saw already throughout the talk and John Sorensis as well. He doesn't just live in visual cortex. Uh, and this is my lab and thank you so much for your attention.